Welcome uh, to uh, today's History of Medicine History Talk, uh, the first in our series of six talks for the 2020 calendar year. My name is Jeff Resnick. I'm chief of the History of Medicine Division here at the National Library of Medicine of the National Institutes of Health. And it's my privilege to welcome all of you uh, here to the National Library of Medicine and to all who are watching remotely via our global live stream and everyone who's following us on Twitter using the hashtag NLMHistTalk. Uh, the History of Medicine talks are designed to promote awareness and use of NLM's historical collections for research, education, and public service in biomedicine, social sciences, and the humanities. The series also supports the commitment of the National Library of Medicine to recognize the diversity of its collections, which span 10 centuries and encompass a variety of digital and physical formats and originate from nearly every part of the world, and also to appreciate the individuals of various disciplines and backgrounds who value these collections and use them in their research, their teaching, and their learning. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to invite all of you to mark your calendars and, and attend our next talk on Thursday, March 26th at 2 o'clock Eastern time that day. We'll welcome Dr. Ashley Bowen of the Science History Institute, where she's Digital Engagement Manager and Public Fellow, funded by the Mellon Foundation and the American Council of Learned Societies. Uh, Dr. Bowen will be speaking on Rise, Serve, Lead, and Publish, including women's physicians' writings in the National Library of Medicine exhibition, Rise, Serve, Lead, America's Women, uh, America's Women Physicians. So please join us on March 26th for our next talk. So it's now my distinct privilege to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Katrin Schultheis, uh, Associate Professor of History at the George Washington University, uh, where she currently serves as Chair of the Department of History. Dr. Schultheis uh, specializes in modern European history with an emphasis on the history of France, women's history, and the history of medicine. Her first book, entitled Bodies and Souls, Politics and the Professionalization of Nursing in France, 1880 to 1922, which was published by Harvard University Press, used nursing as a lens through which to examine the evolution of gender definitions of citizenship. Currently, she is writing a cultural biography of the Charcots, a prominent French family whose members included one of Freud's first mentors, France's best-known pol uh, modern polar explorer, and several generations of women artists. This book focuses on the relationship between art and science in the late 19th and early 20th century, and it stands among many publications by Dr. Schultheis, ranging from articles in journals including Modern Intellectual History, the Journal of the Historical Society, uh, and Policy, Politics, and Nursing Practice, to uh, a variety of writings uh, in the Chronicle of Higher Education and the History News Network. Dr. Schultheis joins us today to talk about aspects of her current research and her next book, in a presentation entitled, wonderfully, The Girl in the Lion Cage, Regulating Hypnotism in 19th Century France. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Schultheis here to the National Library of Medicine. Thank you. Thanks again for the Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. Um, I want to um, just open by thanking uh, Jeff Resnick for inviting me here to give this talk, um, and to a couple of other people, Lindsay France, for for helping out with the technical um, matters here, and to my sister-in-law, Stacey Arneson, for escorting me to this room. Um, so, and also to all of you for coming out here to listen to the talk. Thank you very much. Um, my talk today, as um, Jeff just said, is part of a larger book project. The book has changed its shape a bit since the description that was just read to you. Um, it's, the book is entitled um, Edge of Reason, uh, mind, Brain, and Body in the Age of Charcot. And it's a cultural, uh, it's a history, a cultural and intellectual history of the famous neurologist and reluctant psychologist, Jean-Martin Charcot. There he is. Um, since beginning this book a long time ago, I found the collections here at the National Library of Medicine to be indispensable. Not only does the History of Medicine division hold the complete published work of Charcot, but the general collection has an impressive array of 19th century medical journals. Of particular significance to me um, is, was the fact that they have a hard copy and microfilm versions of a weekly medical journal called Le Progrès Médical. Um, this journal provides, among other things, um, accounts of all of Charcot's lectures, and it was founded and edited by Charcot 
and his student, uh, Bourneville, in 1873. Uh, perhaps because it was printed on that horrible late 19th century high acid paper and therefore crumbles in your hands when you touch it, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, um, Le Progrès Médical has not been available digitally until just this past year when the French Inter-University Library finally did put it up online. The History of Medicine Division here also has a small but very interesting collection of original correspondence by Charcot. Um, and here you can see a letter which was written by Charcot to Georges-Gilles de la Tourette on July 31st in 1893. And it's the short message um, addresses a difficult matter of translation, likely Freud's translation of Charcot's work into German. And he promises in the letter to address the matter when he returns to his trip, but alas, he never returned because he died on August 16th of a heart condition while on this very trip. And finally, the National Library of Medicine has a wonderful a collection of photographs um, that include many of Charcot and of subjects that he addressed in his work. Um, and some of those images you'll be seeing to, in today's talk. Here's an image from the collection of Charcot and his wife, um, Augustine Victoire Durvis Charcot. So the name Charcot today often invokes a split image in the minds of those interested in the history of medicine and psychology. On the one hand, there's Charcot, the pioneering neurologist, who in the second half of the 19th century was the first to offer a coherent medical description of a number of important neurological disorders including multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, a myolateral, a myolateral sclerosis, which at the time was actually referred to as Charcot's disease, and various Tibetic arthropathies. Much of that work still holds up today. On the other hand, there is the Charcot, the so-called celebrity doctor and reluctant psychiatrist slash psychologist, who was an early influential teacher of Freud. From 1885 to 1886, Charcot, uh, excuse me, Freud actually worked in Charcot's laboratory. This is the Charcot who uh, hosted public hysteria shows featuring, so, so to speak, star patients, almost always women, who displayed to rapt audiences the dramatic symptoms of hysteria and who, when hypnotized, exhibited the powerful effects of suggestion. This latter Charcot, and he's here giving his lecture in in this very famous painting. This latter Charcot has often been dismissed by historians as at best misguided and backward looking and at worst arrogant, deceptive, manipulative, exploitative, and misogynist. My book focuses on this second Charcot, not to defend his controversial work on hysteria and hypnosis, but rather to take him and his colleagues seriously as scientists and clinicians fascinated by the mysteries of the mind, brain, body nexus, a nexus that was fully and flamboyantly on display in his hypnotized patients. The phenomenon of hypnotism, as I'll be discussing in my talk, was of immense interest to doctors and researchers, as well as the general public in the 19th century. While the scientific community debated heatedly at times whether susceptibility to hypnotic suggestion was a sign of nervous pathology, as Charcot believed, or a normal feature of the, new, of the human mind, the general public marveled at the seemingly limitless and potentially dangerous ability of one mind to control another. The investigation of hypnosis was part of a surge of interest in the late 19th century in, in what they called psychical phenomenon, as a prominent London-based group termed it. Over the course of the century, learned and popular societies, many with their own journals, popped up across Europe and the U.S. to study such mysterious abilities as mind reading, telekinesis, hallucinations, and communication with the dead, as well as hypnosis, or as it was often called, mesmerism or magnetism. In my talk today, I argue that the efforts by many but not all medical professionals to control the practice of hypnotism in the 19th century was driven by multiple factors. Perhaps first and foremost by the profession's general drive to regulate the practice of medicine, but also by a number of other concerns. Trepidation about the unknown powers of the unconscious mind, which was just beginning to be explored at this time about the recent 
uh, uh, democratization of political power and the so-called psychology of the crowd, about the influence of commercial entertainers, and about the growing presence of women, especially middle class women, in public spaces. So in 1890, in the town of Béziers, a so-called carnival hypnotizer introduced a young girl, one Miss Sperling, into a cage with a live lion. The hypnotist's goal was to demonstrate to the gathered crowd how profound and authentic her hypnotic trance was, so profound that she would neither protest nor show fear when introduced into the cage, so profound that presumably the, the lion would show no interest in her. To be honest, I'm just guessing here, but I have no idea what the guy was thinking when he did this. Um, ignoring the fact that the subject of an earlier hypnotism show had been seriously mauled by a lion, the man proceeded with the demonstration. It did not go well. Spectators watched in horror as the lion seized Miss Sperling in its draw and carried her around the stage. Eventually, she was extracted from, and take, extracted from the cage and taken to a hospital, and she died shortly thereafter from her injuries. The tragedy in Bézier overlapped with another dramatic tale involving hypnotism. This one unfolded in the courtrooms of Paris. For 18 months, between 1889 and 1891, the lurid case of the accused murderer, Gabriel Bompard, dominated newspaper headlines. According to the reports, the young Bompard, along with her older lover, Michel Hérault, had conspired to strangle and rob an affluent Paris Parisian bailiff whose decayed body had been found outside of Paris, uh, excuse me, outside of Lyon. The prosecution claimed that Bompard and Hérault had arranged a sexual rendezvous between Bompard and the victim with the intent of robbing and murdering him. During the encounter, Bompard allegedly managed to slip a red silk cord around the unsuspecting man's neck, and within seconds, Hérault, who had, had earlier hidden himself behind a curtain, yanked the cord, strangling the bailiff. You can see this graphically displayed here. And there, were, there are many, many um, illustrations like this. Articles and trial testimony reveled in the sordid details of the case. Bompard's past abuse at the hands of nuns, teachers, and her own father, a well-to-do businessman. Her apparent lasciviousness, with, which manifested itself in serial love affairs. Her romantic and eventually criminal relationship with the unscrupulous Michel Hérault. The obvious eroticism of the final assault on the bailiff and her dramatic displays of irrational behavior upon her return to France and while in prison. But what elevated the case above the standard sensational fare for which the newspapers of the day did not lack was the question of Bompard's responsibility for her own actions. Doctors and other expert, doctors and other expert witnesses debated whether Bompard, a young woman whose mental and psychological health was questionable at best, had conscious control over her alleged criminal behavior. The star witness for the defense was Jules Liégeois, a law professor from Nancy, with a strong interest in the criminal risks of hypnotism. Setting aside the question of Bompard's fundamental moral character, Liégeois argued that only hypnotic suggestion could account for her behavior. How do you explain her undeniable tie to a man whom she obeys like a dog, he asked in court. Liégeois offered a lengthy description of experiments that he himself had conducted, complete with photos and lab notes, in which hypnotized subjects had been made to commit staged hypothetical crimes ranging from bearing false witness to theft and even to murder. Remember, he stressed, hypnotic suggestion can be issued days, weeks, or even months before the crime. And worst of all, the subject might not even be aware of having been hypnotized or having received the suggestion. He recalled giving a packet of white powder labeled arsenic to a subject, instructing the man to dissolve the arsenic in water and serve it to his aunt at a particular time in the future, which he obediently did. The incredulous general prosecutor asked Liégeois, are you saying that a, su a suggestible subject puts herself in harm's way if she does something as innocent as travel alone by train? Exactly, replied Liégeois. Someone like Bompard, he warned, could be controlled by a gesture as commonplace as a hard stare. Liégeois was not even deterred by Bompard's own statement that Hérault had never hypnotized her. After all, Liégeois maintained, Hérault may well have commanded her not to remember. 
But Liegeois was not the only expert on hypnosis to testify. Paul Broardel, a well-known physician with a special interest in legal medicine, warned that one must proceed with extreme caution when confronted with a claim of innocence by reason of hypnosis. All too often, he warned, the accused was never actually hypnotized and in many cases could not be hypnotized. A more likely explanation for Bompard's behavior, he contended, lay in the far more commonplace situation wherein one person in a relationship exhibits excessive control over the other. That happens every day in certain circles, he remarked. Bompard, he concluded, should be held responsible for her actions. Eventually, the court backed the prosecution and decided that the question of whether Bompard had been um, under the influence of hypnotic suggestion was irrelevant. Citing explicitly the work of Charcot, the world's best known expert on hypnosis, the prosecutor general concluded that hypnotism could never overcome an individual's core convictions or alter her fundamental character and personality. In hypnotic sleep, the will cannot be stolen. It can, it can be stolen, but it cannot be abolished, he declared. The sleeping being still understands good and evil. One cannot throw a hypnotized subject into a crime like a hunting dog on a trail, end quote. The prosecutor feared that allowing hypnotism to serve as a defense against criminal liability could potentially undermine the entire justice system. Quote, if hypnotism, a little understood phenomenon, is allowed to triumph here, he concluded, it will mean the negation of free will, of human freedom, and in the, fu and in the future we will not be able to hold assassins responsible for taking human life. End quote. Allowing that Bompard probably suffered from mental illness, a consideration that resulted in a reduction of her sentence, the court nonetheless judged that her crime was the product of her own flawed moral character. Now, the Sperling and Bompard episodes in many ways could not have been more different. Sperling was presented as the innocent, ignorant victim duped by a charlatan, a popular hypnotizer with no scruples about exploiting and abusing his subjects. Her role in the tra tragedy was utterly passive. The fact that she had been hypnotized was not in question. She was no more responsible for her fate than a person attacked in her bed while sleeping. To those seeking to regulate the practice of hypnotism, Miss Sperling, the girl in the lion cage, represented the danger faced by ordinary people in a world where malicious mind controllers traveled the continent preying on a credulous, curious populace eager to participate in the latest entertainment. The risk, as Liegeois had suggested in his testimony in the Bompard case, was especially great for women who in this period were increasingly likely to be walking around alone. Bompard's image was more complicated. Her defenders cast her as innocent victim of a scheming lover who controlled her through hypnotic suggestion, much like Miss Sperling. But her accusers argued that she was fully complicit in the crime and her defenders were simply exploiting the hypnotism craze in order to literally get, let her get away with murder. Though she may have been mentally ill, her will remained her own. Hypnotism was besides the point since the will could not be completely destroyed even by the most susceptible, even in the most susceptible subject. Behind these cases was uncertainty about what hypnotism in fact was. For Charcot, Bruardel, and others who worked um, whose work centered around the Salpetriere Hospital in Paris, susceptibility to hypnotism um, and hypnotic suggestion was a symptom of underlying hysteria, a sign of neurotic pathology. To others, in particular, a group centered around Hippolyte Bernheim in Nancy, which is where um, Liegeois came from, which is a town in northeastern France, hypnotic sleep was not qualitatively different from normal sleep and all people were, to one degree or another, suggestible. For Charcot and the so-called Salpetriere School, then, the need to regulate the practice of hypnotism stemmed from a belief that there were people with latent hysteria whose pathology could be triggered by the exposure to hypnotism outside of a medical setting. For the Nancy School, the Norman, normal human susceptibility to hypnotic suggestion was not pathological and, in fact, could be put to positive use for behavior modification, pain relief, and even as a form of anesthesia. Yet the normality and implied ubiquity of hypnotic suggestion was also potentially alarming to some. If everyone is suggestible by virtue of being human, then what becomes of the autonomous will? 
As the sociologist Gabrielle Tard wrote in 1891 at exactly the same time, quote, to have only suggested ideas and to believe them to be one's own, that is the illusion of the hypnotized sleepwalker and equally of social man, end quote. In modern society, in other words, there are no original ideas, only suggestions. The autonomous self is an illusion. Tard, it should be said, observed numerous hypnotism sessions at the Salpetriere Hospital. Now, over the course of the 1880s and early 1890s, public, legal, and medical interest in hypnotism skyrocketed across Europe. Although Franz Anton Mesmer had drawn huge crowds with his demonstration of the mysterious powers of animal magnetism in the late 18th century, condemnation by various professional medical societies in the early 19th century had pushed the practice outside the bounds of scientific discourse. You can note in this image here is one image. This is from the uh, Library of Medicine Digital Collections. You can see here the conce concept of mesmerism is quite different from hypnotism. Here you have the, the mesmerist who's clearly directing the force of magnetism to his subject. So the idea was that it was the, the person with the gift was the magnetizer rather than the subject themselves. Um, and here's yet another image from 1826, also from the collection here, of, of a clearly sort of malicious looking hypnotizer here. Um, so um, by mid-century, however, increasing numbers of reputable men of science were growing interested in the subject and lent it a modicum of legitimacy. Um, and it once again started to gain popularity. Capitalizing on rejuvenated interest in the once marginal subject, self-taught magnetists traveled from town to town with their hypnotism shows. Before crowds of sometimes hundreds of onlookers, they produced spectacles like the one with poor Miss Sperling in the lion cage that often involved experienced and paid hypnotic su uh, hyp hypnotism subjects, but also attracted curious or sensation-seeking volunteers from the audience. The Danish magnetist Carl uh, Hansen drew huge crowds in Scandinavia, Russia, Britain, Austria, and especially Germany, while the Belgian Donato, whose real name was Alfred de Hont, uh, uh, performed to sold-out theaters across France, Italy, and Switzerland, as well as the United States. University, university professors and their students flocked to the performances along with working men and women who often took their children to witness the marvels that they had seen advertised. Here you can see the image on the right is of someone being advertised as a magician who could do all kinds of illusions and magnetism and spiritism um, is listed alongside of all kinds of sort of standard card tricks and, and um, other magic tricks. Um, Wherever they went, one doctor complained, professional hypnotists caused, quote, a veritable magne magnetic fever, especially among the youth. While these shows continued to draw crowds, much of the medical community excoriated the magnetizers for endangering the public and encroaching on the territory of medical professionals. Hypnotism, they argued, was a powerful and legitimate therapeutic and diagnostic technique, but only when deployed by doctors. The potential for amateur hypnotism to aid in the perpetuation of crime elicited the most ominous warnings and predictions from doctors anxious to keep the practice out of the hands of the general public. Possible crimes that could be committed ranged from legal and financial fraud, as Liegeois had suggested in the Bompard trial, to perjury and theft, to rape and murder. Women stood at the center of the discourse on the dangers of hypnotism. The gruesome incident in the busy lion cage was only the latest in a series of episodes in which women were cast as the victims of predatory hypnotizers. Critics, most of whom were doctors, repeated, repeatedly brought up cases from the past to show that women were especially vulnerable to the evil effects of hypnotic suggestion. In one particularly horrifying, well-publicized, and often recounted case from 1865, a vagrant named Castellan allegedly hypnotized a young girl and repeatedly raped her while she was under his power. 
A doctor recounted two decades later that, quote, Josephine was aware of what happened, but retained by an invisible force. She could make no motion nor utter a cry, even though her will protested against the attack that had been committed. For his part, Castellon admitted that it was his magnetic passes that caused Josephine's fainting spell that preceded the rape, end quote. Although she eventually managed to escape, and Castellon was later convicted and condemned to 12 years of forced labor, Josephine, quote, never returned to full reason, end quote. Perpetrators of hypnotically induced crimes were not limited to marginal members of society like Castellon. Perhaps the most famous such case involved a magnetizer turned dentist named Dr. Levy, who, according to Bruardel, quote, did not hesitate to rape a hypnotized, unfortunate young girl who came to him seeking help, end quote. Levy was sentenced to 10 years in prison, and the girl gave birth to a stillborn child after a seven-month pregnancy. Although the dentist claimed that the relationship had been, had been cons consensual, pointing to the undisputed fact that the girl's mother had been in the room when the encounters occurred, the court determined that the mother had been oblivious while the girl was subdued in a state of lethargy, one of the recognized sta uh, stages of the hypnotic trance. By the late 1880s and early 1890s, the potential for hypnotism to aid in the perpetration of a crime elicited a drumbeat of ominous warnings and predictions from doctors. Georges-Gilles de la Tourette, a student of Charcot's and the most outspoken advocate of, res of restricting popular hypnosis, warned in 1886 that, quote, in criminal or at least un unscrupulous hands, Hypnosis can become a dangerous weapon, as dangerous for the body as for the morality of hypnotized individuals, end quote. The physiologist uh, Charles Richet reported that he had given a hypnotized child a pistol and told him that an, at an appointed hour in the future he should shoot his mother. The boy dutifully and tearfully appeared before his mother at the designated time, though the mother, who was collaborating in the experiment, prevented his actually firing at her. An American doctor concluded that because, quote, the hypnotized person has no conscience, end quote, he, or it, excuse me, because the hypnotized person has no conscience, he would not hesitate to commit theft, perjury, or even assassination, end quote. Ironically, however, these very doctors were in part responsible for the enormous surge in hypnotic practice popular and medical alike. Doctors in late 19th century France welcomed broad interest in their work and frequently opened their lecture halls to members of the broader community. History and hypnos uh, hysteria and hypnosis were particularly popular topics, and hospitals regularly hosted sessions by physicians who demonstrated in dramatic fashion the effects of hypnotism on patients in their clinics. By 1890, the practice had become so widespread in Paris that a city councilor complained to the hospital administrators that, quote, it is common to see politicians, journalists, and actors in hospitals and conducting experiments on somnambulism. As you can see in this image here, it looks like it's just a Charcot lecturing to a bunch of um, medical students. In fact, um, three of the people in this audience are uh, novelists, and one of them's an art critic, and another one is a politician. The director of public assistance, which administered the city's hospital, responded to the complaints, noting that he had no authority over the press and that, quote, in the interest of the development of science and the relief of the sick, quote, it was not the policy of the administration to limit the information provided to hos in hospitals to medical personnel alone. And no one bore more responsibility for introducing the public to the practice of scientific hypnotism than Charcot. Uh, it was he who, in 1882, delivered a paper to the prestigious Academy of Sciences arguing that hypnotized subjects all pass through three distinct phases, catalepsy, lethargy, and somnambulism, each defined by specific physiological markers that could not be faked. In the first, and especially the last phases, subjects were particularly receptive to suggestion. The paper created quite a sensation and was widely hailed as marking the moment when hypnotism became a legitimate topic of scientific inquiry. Charcot conducted innumerable experiments, demonstrate, uh, experimental uh, hypnosis demonstrations at the Salpetriere Hospital in Paris. In 
His goal was to artificially induce the symptoms of hysteria and thereby, he hoped, gain insight into the mysterious origins of the disease and potentially find a cure for it. Women drawn from among the many long-term residents of the Salpetriere Hospital were brought into his amphitheater. Once hypnotized, they would perform actions on command. A patient might, might shrink in horror when told that a string was a snake or bend down smiling to pick invisible flowers or stroke a non-existent cat that she was told was purring in her arms. In a more alarming experiment, a hypnotized young woman was instructed while in a trance that the paper knife placed in her hands was a dagger and that she must murder a particular individual in the room. On awakening, two observing doctors recalled, quote, the patient hovers around her victim and suddenly strikes him with such violence that I think it well to refrain from such experiments in the future. In another demonstration, the most famous of Charcot's hysteria patients, Blanche Whitman, was commanded while hypnotized to poison the novelist and theater director, Jules Carité, who was in the audience, incidentally, of the painting I showed you. Um, he, Clarité frequently attended Salpetriere sessions. Quote, with a charming good grace and adorably perfidious feminine smile, Clarité recalled, the poor unconscious woman offered me the glass she believed to be poisoned. These types of demonstrations became popular attractions. Sarah Bernhardt allegedly attended them, as did the philosopher Hippolyte Ten, the writer Guy de Maupassant, and the sociologist Gabrielle Tard, who I mentioned a moment ago. One popular hypnotizer, a Madame Andrea, even claimed that she had discovered her own talent for hypnotism in the clinic of Dr. Charcot. Hypnotism became the subject of novels, serialized stories, and plays. A year after the fake poisoning incident, Clarité published a best-selling novel named Jean Marnas, which he stated was based on his observations at the Salpetriere. The novel centered on, an, centered on an ambitious but lazy young man who hypnotizes his innocent, unwitting lover and commands her to rob his wealthy employer. The potentially catastrophic effects of hypnotism were none too subtly borne out when the unfortunate girl accidentally kills the man she is directed to rob and is apprehended for the crime. Although she has no conscious memory of committing the crime, when returned to a hypnotic state by the family doctor, she at last names Mornas as the mastermind behind the plot. I wonder whether Gabrielle Bompard and Michel Hérault had read that novel. For many doctors, including Charcot, the serious criminal potential of unregulated hypnotism was more hypothetical than real, and the more ominous threat was not to law and order, but to public health. Popular magnetizers with neither medical nor scientific mandate and, mo and, ma and motivated only by the pursuit of money could, he argued, inadvertently bring about nervous breakdowns and mass hysteria among audiences in whole villages unaware of the power of hypnosis. On several occasions, Charcot found himself in the position of attempting to undo the damage caused by non-medical magnetizers. In one instance, he was called upon to treat a 12-year-old boy who had been hypnotized by two high school students after a visit to their village by a popular magnetizer. The popular exhibits caused panic among the population, Charcot complained, and gave rise to, quote, the appearance of a kind of acti active hypnotic mania which reached the village high school. Although the school principal managed to bring the mania under control among boarding students, two day students eluded discipline and succeeded by means of fascination of the eyes to put the young boy in a hypnotic trance. They then proceeded to induce him to parade nearly naked in front of the Bank of France and to demand to buy a horse from a storekeeper. These relatively harmless pranks took a dark turn about two weeks later when the boy who had no previous history of mental illness began to experience experienced daily hysterical fits preceded by headaches and ringing in the ears. What finally brought his father to call on Charcot was when the victim's four-year-old brother began to exhibit similar symptoms. The doctor was optimistic that the boy would recover once treated with isolation and hydrotherapy, but he warned that cases such as this were far from rare. Ominously, he noted these accidents seem to occur most frequently, not among known hysterics, but among those without any previously recognized nervous problems. Hypnotism, he warned, all too often uncovered hidden weaknesses in a subject's nervous system, weaknesses that might never otherwise emerge. Any event or practice that stimulated a, quote, inordinate belief in the marvelous or which powerfully stimulates the imagination could precipitate the onset of hysteria and a loss of the capacity to distinguish between imagination and reality.
Doctors complained that public display of so-called magnetism frequently resulted in outbreaks of hysterical fits and hysterical paralysis, not just among participants and direct targets, but among onlookers as well. Today, we know perfectly well that the popular spread of hypnotism can be followed, Charcot wrote, even for those merely in attendance by accidents either immediately or in the long term, accidents that are quite seriously, even serious, even grave. The Review of Hypnotism, a journal from the period, warned in 1890 that popular hypnotists posed an imminent danger to society because they, quote, are frequently the starting point of a nervous contagion which effect, who, whose effects are harmful because we consider it an affront to human dignity to make a show of individuals who are deprived temporarily of their free will. In the US as well, the threat posed by popular hypnotism was widely recognized that it was not prohibited. Here's a piece from an 1890 issue of the American Journal of Dental Sciences, which I found in the NLM holdings. It's reprinted from the Kansas City medical record. Dentists were particularly interested in hypnotism because they thought it could serve as a form of anesthesia for dental procedures. The article titled The Hypnotism Craze and Its Dangers noted that hypnotism, which is now at the height of fashion, is nothing more than a new edition of the threadbare practice of mesmerism. It is strange, the author notes, that the medical profession should go wild over an idea so old. He, blames, he blamed the French, remarking that, quote, at the meeting of the British Medical Association at Leeds, England last summer, we were annoyed by a couple of supercilious nabobs from Paris who persisted in reading lengthy papers on this subject, much to the disgust of the members of the association, end quote. Though the author dismissed hypnotism as archaic and ridiculous, he nonetheless believed it to be both powerful and dangerous. Quote, while hypnotism may be used with advantage in dispelling delusions in hysterical women and for the cure of hysterical pain and other imaginary ailments, it becomes dangerous in such cases in the hands of, uns of an unscrupulous person. The social danger is the most to be feared. Crimes may be committed under its influence. Even the mind may become unbalanced and the patient may go crazy on the subject just as a person becomes de deranged over undue excitement at religious meetings and the like. End quote. By the late 1880s, the problem of the unregulated popular, of unregulated popular hypnotism was widely regarded in Europe, in, Europe as a, in Europe as a public health threat. The internationally renowned Donato had his, his performance permit revoked in Milan in 1887. In, in Bologna, theater owners were forbidden to rent their theaters to him. By 1888, Austria, Italy, Denmark, Germany, Spain, Portugal, and most Swiss cantons had outlawed all public demonstrations by hypnotists, and shortly thereafter, the Belgian government followed suit. By 1890, England, too, had pro prohibited the practice of hypnotism unless it had a scientific objective, and by 1891, hypnotism could be practiced in Russia only in the presence of three doctors. In France, the story was a bit different from the rest of Europe. There, doctors and other proponents of regulation encountered resistance. Although the Society of Legal Medicine voted in 1886 to create a commission on the regulation of hypnotism, no action was taken on a national level. Only the city of Bordeaux outlawed public exhi exhibitions of magnetism in response to the, quote, veritable epidemic of hypnotic insanity, end quote, and the attempted suicide of one particip participant precipitated by a visit by Donato in 1888. On April 3rd, April 88, the section of hygiene and medical medicine of the French Association for the Advancement of Science voted, quote, that, dis that public displays of magnetism and hypnotism should be forbidden throughout French territory and that the uses of hypnotism and magnetism as curative measures should submit to the laws that regulate the practice of medicine, end quote. But the measure languished in French Parliament. By the end of 1889, Georges Gilles de la Tourette lamented that our country has thus become the refuge of all the entertainer magnetizers whose posters cover the walls of the city. Thwarted in their efforts to curb popular hypnotism directly, the French medical profession tried another approach. In 1892, the government passed a revised law on the practice of medicine, which mandated that only licensed doctors, midwives, and dentists could practice their respective professions and laid out penalties for those who violated the code. <clears throat> 
But this fortification of professional boundaries made no specific mention of hypnotism. That absence made it possible for popular hypnotism to continue to thrive. For example, in 1893, the new Magnetic Society of France opened a private school of magnetism in Paris with the stated goal to put therapeutic magnetism at the disposal of amateurs. The law did have some impact. Going forward, popular magnetizers were the most part careful to avoid claims that they offered medical treatment. Nonetheless, lay hypnotists continued to apply their trade to enthusiastic audiences and theaters throughout the country and well into the next century. Donato himself was still touring France in 1924. But the desire to police the borders of professional medical practice was not the only reason that doctors and sympathetic legislators sought to regulate hypnotism. For Charcot and many of his colleagues, regulating hypnotism was also part of their ongoing effort to combat the mystifying forces of religion, superstition, and occultism. To them, popular as opposed to scientific hypnotism arose from the same cultural impulses that made seances, speaking with the dead, automatic, automated writing, automatic writing, and spiritualist pursuits of all kinds so pervasive in the closing decades of the 19th century. It was the product of the same forces that stimulated a marked increase in reported miraculous sightings of the Virgin Mary and the establishment of shrines with mysterious healing powers. This was the era of mass pilgrimage to the miraculous spring in the grotto of Bernadette in Lourdes, for example. Popular hypnotism was, in short, a dangerous display of unreason. By claiming it for scientific medicine and attempting to confine it within the law, they sought to shore up the domain of reason and order against what they perceived as the disorderly, potentially chaotic forces of emotions and the unconscious. In the end, then, the story of the girl in the lion cage and the numerous other sensational accounts of hypnos hypnosis gone awry expressed both the excitement and trepidation surrounding the acute awareness that the mind was not entirely or perhaps even primarily an instrument of reason. The ambivalent French response, on the one hand, loud calls for regulation from many doctors and legal experts, and on the other, unwillingness on the part of the government to take definitive action, reflected broader anxieties about the powerful changes that marked the decades surrounding the turn of the century. Changes that suggested that positivist science, which most, sci most French doctors fervently believed in, would determine the future of society, that, it might, that positivism might not triumph in the end. This was, after all, a France that had barely survived the chaos of the Franco-Prussian War and the violent destruction of the Paris Commune in 1870 that arose in its wake. It was a France whose Republican government had nearly succumbed to an autocratic, charismatic military general in the late 1880s. It was a France divided between clerical backers of the church and anti-clerical promoters of positivism. It was a France with, growing, with a growing industrialized and modernizing cities dominated by liberals and radicals, but also a still significant rural agricultural sector that remained conservative and religious. The threat presented by hypnotism should, I think, be understood simultaneously as a professional response to a perceived real public health threat, as an expression of anxiety about the powers of the mind that were only beginning to be explored, and by the rapid social, political, and cultural changes that marked the last decade of the 19th century. This was the Belle Epoque, but beneath the elegant surface of an affluent, carefree society lay many uncertainties and potential dangers, dangers that, like nervous weaknesses, could, by accident or intention, be brought to the fore. Thank you. Thank you. This, I, I enjoyed your talk very much. This is a wonderful, uh, really interesting subject to, uh, to kind of delve into. My question is about the kind of the fading popularity of hypnotism, mesmerism, you know, into from from the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, they you know obviously it's still used today for smoking cessation and diet control and things like that. But the attention on it, you know, when when you consider the examples of the extreme capabilities of hypnotists, you know, to to have a girl lose her life in a lion cage or, you know, to, to commit crimes and things like that. Even without strong regulation, 
all of that faded away. W was that just a gradual realization by the medical community that that these uh, these these claims aren't as as concrete as imagined, or were there particular incidents that 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 you think kind of led to the fact that now hypnotism is uh, relegated to either uh, comedy shows or smoking cessation? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, it's, it fades, I mean, there, this, the, the big division in the late 19th century was whether, was whether hypnotism was a form, a symptom of a disease, or whether hypnotism was, you know, a, a normal attribute of the human mind and could be used for positive purposes. And then, so, and that latter perspective, what's called the Nazi school, triumphs by the turn of the century so that it becomes sort of, it becomes diminished in its sensationalism, I think, because, in part because, ironically, I think, because it was understood to be, suggestibility, for example, was understood to be part of the normal human psychology. Um, and then a lot of the expectations, the kind of supernatural, if you will, expectations for what it could do seem to be, um, the, the expectations were sort of tamped down when it became sort of normalized in that way. Because even the early people in the 1860s and 70s who were practicing hypnotism kind of beneath the radar, particularly in, in eastern France around in the Nancy area, were doing so like country doctors were doing it, right? And they would do things to relieve pain and, um, and those sort of more modest claims. And so when the focus shifted to more back to that, um, I think a lot of these more um, sensational claims faded and the more dramatic shows became associated with carnivals and, and that discredited it to be, uh, I think, to a large extent. There's another reason I think too is that there's, especially in Charcot's demonstrations and other people's demonstrations, there were broadly, many people believed them to be faked. Um, that the kinds of, for example, the, um, the woman uh, Blanche Whitman, who was in that, um, in that famous painting here, she's the woman here, it's sort of draped over Charcot's assistant's arms. Um, Blanche Whitman was considered one of the star performers of the, of the hysteria and hypnosis shows. Um, and there are many who believed at the time that th these were people just acting. Um, and that they, they loved their audience and they were performing. So there was a whole nother discrediting going on having to do with the fact that these, some of these more dramatic displays were actually completely faked. Um, and I think Charcot's claim that they weren't faked were, was tied to his belief that there were physical um, signs of being uh, hypnotized that you couldn't fake, like your pulse racing and things like that. Um, but when those were kind of discredited, then the whole artifice, I think, fell apart. Thank you very Thank much. You. What is your opinion of Charcot's belief? Did he think this was real? Yes. He definitely thought hypnotism was real. He thought it was, he called it artificial hysteria. In other words, it was a way of, by bringing about a hypnotic trance, you could see hysteria playing itself out. By, but you could control it because you can control it with whatever mechanism you use to induce hypnosis. So he saw it as a diagnostic tool and as a way to try to explore what the unconscious mind was doing during a hysteria episode. Um, and this, uh, this period is so interesting because to my mind, it's, it's, they're trying to figure out how the brain functions and they're also trying to figure out how the mind functions and they're trying to bring those two together. So in other words, it's the, the moment where in, I think where where neuropsychology is, starts really because they're trying to connect what they, the growing knowledge about how the brain works with some of these, these behaviors that they can't otherwise explain. So he, he couldn't explain what the process of hypnosis was, which is why they keep using terms like magnetism because Charcot did a lot of experiments with different metals and he could transfer hysterical symptoms from one side of the body to the other by using magnets. So they believed that magnets were part, had some physiological but also psychological components to it and effects, but um, they didn't know how it functioned at all. And they're trying to measure things and they're trying to 
figure out whether this is an electrical phenomenon or it's something else, but he definitely believed it to be real, and he swore that his patients weren't acting. Um, but a lot of people didn't believe him. Because I'm thinking um, it's a few decades earlier, but also in France, Duchenne de Boulogne trying to um, stimulate emotion by attaching electrodes. Right, by doing what? By attaching electrodes to the face in those, and of course he was a fairly respected neurologist, um, but I've always had some issues with those pictures. I find them um, unconvincing and photographically kind of sketchy as well. Yeah, they're, they're really, I mean, they've, they've, they've figured out by this point that there's electrical, the, the brain is functions electrically, but they don't know how, they, they don't know how to measure it or what to do with that. Um, and uh, Duchenne de Bologna was, uh, Charcot greatly revered Duchenne de Bologna, he's someone he constantly cites as, as the founding father of French neurology, even though Charcot is often given that title. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're trying to figure out exactly what's going on. This is the time when they're figuring out uh, cerebral localization, for example. Um, and Charcot does a lot of work trying to figure out where, you know, where, where would neurotic disease be located in the brain, right? If you have hysteria, where would you find it, right? If, if everything is localized in the, uh, somewhere in the brain, how do you locate a functional disease like hysteria? Yes. A uh, question. Th thank you so much for the uh, for the lecture. Uh, the question is regarding the mental health condition after the patient or after the participant subject under this uh, hypnotizing. Uh, you have cited earlier one of the patient, one of the women participated. She was never recovered from reasoning. Right. So again, so. Some of these, I mean, Charcot's patients were usually being treated for hysteria, and so hysteria, so hypnotism was, was folded into their general mental health issues, so it's very hard to tell what, what um, part of their health was directly related to the hypnotism that they were subjected to and what was some underlying mental health issue. It's very hard to tell. The... It's very hard to learn what actually happened in many of these cases because they're appearing, the cases I'm citing are appearing in newspapers and they're always very sensationalized accounts. Um, and people were twisting those stories for their own purposes. So when they say, you know, she never recovered from her experience, I mean, presuming that what happened actually did happen, in other words, she was somehow seduced and raped and, and potentially hypnotized, you know, she, she didn't recover, she probably didn't recover from the violence that was perpetrated against her. It's not clear that it was the hypnotism itself that she never recovered from, right? So, but there's very little, the newspapers, excuse me, totally lose interest in these cases once, you know, they're no longer sensational hypnotism exercises. So I can't really um, answer that question definitively. Thank you. Yeah. So. What do you think accounts for the um, the case of the girl in the lion cage? Was she was she an accomplice in a hoax that went bad, or was she was did that dramatic effect emerge because she really believed it was going to happen? So I reread several of the accounts in the newspapers yesterday just to try to, to try to answer some of those questions because there are. No, a number of accounts, and they tend to be very similar, um, and they don't specify whether she was um, someone who worked with the hypnotist, was like a professional, because a, a lot of these hypnotists traveled with their own subjects, and those would be professional subjects, which again raises the question of how many of the dramatic effects were actually real and how many of them were, were performative. Um, but I don't know whether she was plucked from the audience and introduced into a lion cage, you know, whether she was hypnotized before, and one of the articles actually asks this question, we don't know whether she was hypnotized before and then led into the lion cage as a way of showing, look, she is so, um, she is so unaware that she can be led even into a lion cage without protesting. Um, so I can't, I, unfortunately I don't know the answer, but in, um, most of the descriptions have her lying sleeping, 
There are no pictures, unfortunately, I would have shown it to you. But they describe her sleeping in the cage. And now I don't know why they thought a lion wouldn't be interested in a sleeping person as opposed to a live person. It makes no sense to me. So, um, so the whole incident is bizarre. Um, but it wasn't the first time it happened. That's the other crazy thing, that they had been in the same town. They'd done the same thing with a lion, and it, the, the woman in that instance was not killed, but she was mauled. Um, but there was also, kind of unrelated, I guess, but there was a kind of craze for putting wild animals on stages during the late 19th century, and there were some very famous theater productions where leopards and lions would just be paraded on live ones onto the stage during theater performances. I mean, I, I don't know the origins of that craze, but I think this might have fit into that. Um, but I don't know. It, my own suspicion is that she was part of the show, um, and then it went wrong. Yeah. To what extent were the subjects male um, instead of female, or if it if, if this was used to treat hysteria? Hysteria, I believe, was generally associated with women, primarily at the time, at least. So I don't know if you can say anything about. Yeah. The so. Use of male. Yeah. So it's a good question. The. Um, when you see descriptions of the popular hypnotism, all, the, the pairing you often see, you most frequently see by far, is a male hypnotizer with a female subject. Like, that's the show, right? And, so, and you see that played out in all kinds of, of scenarios, um, which is why the, the, um, you know, the trial, the bone power trial was so perfect, because it fit the whole trope of the male hypnotizer and the helpless girl who could be seduced at, by uh, uh, the wrong kind of stare, for example. Um, but there are, in, uh, children were also particularly vulnerable, as, as the example I mentioned. It's interesting, I mean, hysteria was certainly more associated with women than men, um, but Charcot was the, one of the first people, if not the first people, to insist that hysteria was as common in men as it was in women. Um, so, and he, he wrote articles about it, and he said it's not, you know, it's not commonly known, but it's very clear that this is just as common in men and women, although its causes are often different. He saw men as hysteria arising from physical trauma of some kind, like an accident, whereas women's, uh, women's hysteria often was stimulated by some kind of emotional trauma. But um, both, um, he saw it as happening for both. However, his subjects, like in this instance here, this painting here, his subjects were all drawn from the Salpetriere Hospital, which was a women's hospital. So that's all the pictures you'll see with Charcot with his star, his hypnotism stars and his hysteria stars are all going to be women um, because that's who was in his hospital. Yeah. A uh, very simple question, like, is there any actual scientific evidence for any of the claims of hypnotism? Like, what is known about it? What is true about it? Yeah, so I think that um, maybe someone in the audience um, can speak to it. I mean, what little I've read about, I mean, I know it's still, as, as, the, as you were saying, you know, there, is, there are plenty of uh, hypnotism pra um, practices going on today, and um, I don't know what the physiology of it is, but I think there's some acceptance that it can work in, but whether it works on a physiological level or on a purely psychological level, I don't know. Do you happen to know that? that? No, I, I just know that, uh, you know, it, as you said, it's, it, it's, it's prevalent in, in diet control, smoking control, and comedy shows. <laughs> that's that's yeah. where, uh, right. where you tend to see it these days. So. Right. So... Um, and I know, I mean, I, what little I've read is that there is sort of a physiological response to, you know, certain visual, like, you know, the, the, the pendulum swinging and that it tires the eyes in a certain way and that puts certain, lulls certain parts of the brain into being, you know, less active and that allows for greater receptivity. So there's some, you know, attempted scientific explanations. I don't think it's entirely discredited, but it's certainly considered to be alternative medicine. Um, and again, I wish I had a better answer to that. Um, 
there's a whole there's a whole genre of hypnotism if you read from 20th century like there was there's all kinds of anti-Semitic literature from the from the 1930s Germany where um, you know Jews are supposedly going around and controlling with mind control and controlling people that was one of the um, one of the accusations that was brought about them so at, during times of panic there's often accusations of hypnotism that go on publicly yeah. I'm doing a little quick and dirty research here. Um, this also corresponds to the time when lion taming became a thing in traveling mm -hmm. shows. So that may tie into your wild animals on stage thing. But um, in the last quarter of the 19th century, you see professional lion tamers as being um, an attraction. Right, and that has a lot to do with French expanded colonialism into Africa, of course. And so they're encountering lions for the first time and taming those lions is part of the you know imperial project so it's it all it all comes together right um during this time all right well i think our time is up here it's three o'clock thank you again so much for coming i really appreciate it